So one of the questions I get asked from you guys all the time is, Willie, how do we take our spores, whether it's a print or a syringe, and store it away for long-term use? You got a bunch of prints or a bunch of syringes, but you could only use one or two at the moment or you're not ready to use any at all. But you want to make sure a year from now, two years from now, they're still viable just like they are the first day that you get them. And then on the other side of the coin, I have people telling me, Willie, I've been doing this for a little while. I've been building up my spore prints or my spore syringes and I want to make things more professional. I want to bring things to the next level. Can you show me how to build a spore library, how to organize it by showing us one of your spore libraries and the spores that you're working with right now? So before I drag this on any further, let's jump into it. Dripping on acid in the hotel lobby. Everything moving hella fast, Ricky Bobby. Floating in the ethers. Listen to the ethers, you can probably tell the future. Superhuman man. What's going on, Trip Team? First of all, I just want to say I love you guys. Thank you for joining me on a brand new video. Now, if you haven't done it already, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below and that bell off to the side because that's going to alert you when there's a new video. Also, follow me on social media because as you guys know, I'm always doing giveaways. There's really no rhyme or reason to my giveaways, but most of the stuff you guys see me use in my videos, including this one, I'm going to be giving away to people that need it. I'm always doing giveaways, but there's really no rhyme or reason, like I said. So the only way for you to know when I'm doing a giveaway is if you have them alerts on and you're on top of stuff. You know, every time I announce a giveaway winner, there's always a few people, oh, Willie, how could you do this? I wish I would have known. How was we supposed to know? If you guys had the alerts on, you guys would have known and you guys could have entered to win the giveaway. You know, I give away more stuff than probably anybody else. So make sure you guys go follow me and you guys turn on them notifications because with this channel, I'm going to be giving a ton of stuff away. So make sure you guys are on top of that. Like I said at the beginning of the video, we're going to be getting into how to build your spore library, how to store away your spores for long-term use. I'm going to be showing you guys one of my spore libraries. So I actually have two different spore libraries. One of them is spores that I'm not using at the moment, maybe doubles of spores, stuff that I'm planning on giving away. And then my other spore library is spores that I'm actively using at the moment. And that's the one we're going to be looking at because that's the one that's more interesting. I'm also going to be talking about rare spores, you know, spores that are hard to get your hands on. So once you get your hands on them, you want to make sure you keep them forever. You know, spores can become not viable, which means they won't grow. You know, they could die off. So it's very important that you guys know how to store them away long term to make sure that doesn't happen, especially if you get some rare prints you know there's a lot of prints out there that are really hard to get your hands on there's prints out there that I've been looking to get my hands on that I haven't been able to get my hands on for years and there's some that I've been lucky enough to get my hands on that I know people would kill for you know so we're going to be looking at some of my sports today we're also going to talk about do's and don'ts when it comes to storing things away and the proper way to do it now I am going to be doing a giveaway in this video but in order for you to get in on that giveaway and win something from this video you guys need to go follow me on social media so make sure you guys go check on my Instagram because that's where I'm going to be doing the giveaway very very important you know we want to stay within YouTube's community guidelines so we're going to be doing the giveaway over at Instagram just so we don't violate anything here on YouTube. We want to be friends with YouTube. We don't want to fight with YouTube. We don't want to get any content strikes. So make sure you guys go follow me on Instagram for your chance to win something really special. So first, let's talk about the best and the correct way to store away your prints and your syringes for long-term use. Say you don't want to use them right now, but in a month, a year, two years from now, you guys are going to want to use them. The correct way to store them after they're labeled and dated correctly, you guys want to store them in a Ziploc bag inside a refrigerator, not a freezer. If you guys put them inside of a freezer, that's going to destroy them. You guys don't want to put them inside of a freezer. You guys want to put them inside of a refrigerator where the temperature is above 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but preferably below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That's going to be the best place to store your spore prints in your syringes for long-term use. Now, it's very important that you guys understand the difference between freezer and refrigerator. Try not to mistake the two. You guys want to keep them in the refrigerator, not the freezer. If you freeze your spore prints, it's going to destroy them and they're not going to be viable. 
Very, very important. Most reputable vendors in the winter months, they'll actually send warm packs inside with your spore syringes and your spore prints to make sure that they don't freeze because you don't want them to freeze. So the best temperature range to keep them in is above 32 degrees Fahrenheit and below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Anywhere in between there is going to be perfectly fine. I actually like to keep mine around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the most preferable temperature in my opinion. And if you guys do it that way, you'll notice that your spore prints, your spore syringes will be good a year from now, two years from now. I've even seen people use spore syringes that are three years old that are perfectly viable the same way they were when they first got them. So if you store them away correct, you guys will be perfectly fine. Now, say you guys don't have the ability to store your prints or your syringes inside of your refrigerator, and you guys don't want to make the investment at this point in time into a spore library, but you want to store your spore prints or your syringes away, the best place to do that is in a cool, dark place. So if you guys have a big dresser, store them in the bottom dresser underneath some clothing inside of a Ziploc bag where they're not going to get any direct sunlight, where they're not going to get too hot, they're not going to get too cold, they're not going to get wet, and they'll still stay good for a very long time. Just remember, in the warmer months, it's going to get hotter. In the cooler months, it's going to get colder. So it really depends on the environment that they're in. It depends on how you keep the atmosphere within your house. And that's going to depend on how long the spores stay good for. The best part about having a spore library or keeping them in a fridge, they're at a consistent temperature all the time. The lower the temperature, the better. If you can keep the temperature low and consistent, that's the best. The reason for that is there's less movement at lower temperatures, so the spores kind of go into what's considered hibernation mode. So they kind of go into hibernation, they're not moving that much, and once they warm back up to room temperature, when you guys are ready to use them, they're going to be perfectly fine, just like they were the first day you got them. Like I said, I've heard people using spore syringes that are three, four, five years old that have been stored away in the fridge, and they've grown with no problem whatsoever. Now, of course, you shouldn't bank on a spore syringe being good five years down the road. You want to do something with it before that. But a year, two years is perfectly fine and acceptable if you guys keep it in the refrigerator. The most important thing is storing them away correctly. Make sure they're labeled so you guys know what they are because as time passes by, if you guys don't label them right away, you guys are going to end up forgetting what you have, especially if you have multiple different spore prints, spore syringes. There's no way you guys will recall exactly what they are. So make sure you guys label because that's going to save you a big headache when you guys do go to use them. So that's the very basic way to store your spores away when you're first starting out. But now let's get into a more advanced method, the more professional method, a spore library. We're going to talk about my spore library that I'm working with right now. I'm going to give you guys a little tour how I store it away, what I'm currently working with right now, and I'm also going to talk about the benefits of a spore library. So let's jump into it. I'm going to show you guys my spore library right now. This is a spore library. So what this actually is, is a 70 can igloo beverage cooler. You guys could actually use a bigger one, a smaller one. It's really up to you and how extensive your spore library is. But for the spores that I'm currently working with at the moment, this is the perfect size. It contains everything I need it to contain, including my agar dishes and my culture slants, as well as all the spore prints and spore syringes. Now, I highly suggest that you guys try to stay away from one of them personal refrigerators that we all had in our dorm room during college. The reason for that is they actually include a small freezer in them personal refrigerators. And 
if you have your spore prints or your spore syringes close to that freezer, they can actually freeze. So I suggest using a beverage cooler, a wine cooler, something like that that doesn't include a freezer inside. Now the benefit to having a spore library just like this is consistency. You guys never have to worry about inconsistent temperatures. You never have to worry about it getting too hot or too cold. You guys set your preferred temperature and your spore prints and syringes will last many years to come. It also gives you space for organization. So as you guys could see inside of mine, I actually have separate racks. I have separate containers that hold different things. And that's the way I like it. I like to be very organized, especially when it comes to my prints and my syringes, because I want to know what I'm working with. I don't ever want to make the mistake of mislabeling something and giving it out to the community and for that to fall back on me. Like I've said in some of my older videos, people work really hard to identify and classify these fungi. So we don't want to do anything that would ruin all that hard work. It's happened in the past and we really want to try to avoid that happening again in the future. Another benefit to having a dedicated spore library just like this is cross contamination. So if you guys are just sharing your household refrigerator, putting your prints and your syringes inside there, you have to worry about other bacterias from other types of food and stuff getting on your prints or your syringes. With this, you don't have to worry about any of that. This is solely for your prints, syringes, agar dishes, and culture slants. You don't have to worry about any beverages or food being inside this refrigerator. Now, is it a requirement to have a glass door on your spore library? Absolutely not, but it looks a lot better and it comes in handy. Like I said, I have two different spore libraries, so if I'm looking for something specifically, I kind of could just look through the glass door and see if it's in there before I go cracking things open and moving things around, I could see if that's where it is. Another benefit to it is if you have culture slants or agar dishes inside your spore library, you could just look through the glass and see how they're coming along. I like having the glass door feature, but it's not a requirement. Now, when it comes to the internal temperature of my spore library, I like to keep it around 40 degrees Fahrenheit and I monitor that consistently. So every single day I check the temperatures in my spore library to see if they need to be adjusted. Now on most small beverage refrigerators or coolers just like this, it will actually come with an internal thermometer. But if it doesn't, you could just throw one up there against the wall. That way you could monitor the temperature. You want to keep it above 32 degrees Fahrenheit because once you go to 32 and below, that's the freezing point. So that's when things are going to start to freeze and you definitely want to avoid that at all costs, but you don't want it to go above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Once you go above 50 degrees Fahrenheit, what starts to happen is the movement picks up and that's going to deteriorate your spore prints and your spore syringes a lot faster than if you had them cooler. The only downside to having a spore library as extensive as myself is it takes up space. So you're taking up space in your lab, your office, wherever you choose to work. And that's the only downside, but that's it. There's a lot more upside to it than downside. This is a great way to preserve your spores long-term. So the way I keep things separated and organized in my spore library is I keep my Cubensis or my Cubenzi and my exotics separated. And I also keep my prints and my syringes separated. So I'll usually have all my exotics together. I'll have all my cubensis together. Same thing for the prints. And then as you guys could see in here, I even got some blanks. So these are just blank syringes that have nothing in them. All they are is sterile solution ready for spores. So when I'm ready to make a spore syringe of something that I don't have on hand, I already have blanks ready to go. So I usually have a few of those in my spore library just so I don't need to go and make any new ones. It's not going to hold me up, especially if I'm in the middle of something. Very, very easy to have them on hand. You guys can make them ahead of time. So that way, when you guys are ready to make some spore syringes, you guys already have them ready to go. So first, let's start off with my prints. So down here is where I keep my prints. So as you guys can see, I got two separate bins. We'll get into this one first. So inside this bin right here, I have my Cubensis. So we'll look at a couple of the spore prints that I'm working with right now at this moment. 
We have some Cubensis Elephant Gate. Very rare spore print. I was very lucky to get my hands on a small piece and I've been working them ever since. These will remain in my spore library forever. This is one of the hardest Cubensis prints to actually get your hands on is an original genetics elephant gate. Ask any mycologist and they'll tell you how hard it is to get your hands on one of these prints. So right here we have some Psilocybe Cubensi Columbia Rust print. Right here we have some Cubensis Gulf Coast. Great print to have in your library. Obviously right here we have some Psilocybe Cubensi E4K which is mines and Texas Cubensis Kings substrain. It's a great print to have in your library if you could get your hands on one. Right here we have some Cubensis Fiji. Now these are absolutely amazing. Anybody who's gotten a Fiji print from me in the past will attest. Right here we have some Cubensis Red Boy which is another rust colored spore print. It's a great one to have in your library and from what I've heard it used to not be this way but from what I've heard it's actually pretty hard to get your hands on a print or a syringe of Red Boy right now which is Pretty strange because a couple years back they were readily available. Actually the vendors were giving them away for free. But it's a pretty cool fungi to cultivate and check out underneath your microscope. And of course right here we have some Golden Teacher or GT. Now every time somebody new to mycology asks me, hey Willie what should I start with? I always try to suggest GT. They're very forgiving and they're one of the oldest strains on the market or one of the oldest subspecies on the market. If you was getting mushrooms back in the 60s and 70s, chances are it was probably Golden Teacher. So that's gonna be it for the prints of the Cubensis that I'm working with right now. You know we got some syringes right there, we'll get into those in a second. But first let's go over some of the exotic prints I'm working with right now in my library. For our first print that I'm working with right now is our gyps. So this is some scaly purple gyps. Now gyps are a less common active mushroom that you see people usually working with. Once you start moving on and you want to try new things, I definitely suggest getting a print in your library to start working. I think you guys will absolutely love them. And let's just say the reward is really, really cool once you guys start getting into these. Right here we have some Psilocybe Mexicana variation Jalisco. As you guys know, this is a sclerotia producing mushroom, but you can also fruit them out. And these are one of the originals. So when psilocybin started to be isolated, Mexicana was one of the first mushrooms that were actually isolated for their psilocybin content. So there's a really cool history behind them. So make sure you guys get one of these prints in your library. Next we have some psilocybalenae and the history behind this is really cool but pretty much just to sum it up really fast I don't want to get into a big history lesson. It was overlooked. Mushroom John Allen said no this is a new type of mushroom. He brought it to the lab proved that it was indeed a new type of mushroom. He was able to name it after himself and that's where we get psilocybalenae. Really cool mushroom if you could get it in your spore library. This might be one of the prints that actually end up being rare down the road because I think a lot of people are overlooking this print right now. Next we have some Psilocybe Atlantis. This is not to be confused with ATL number seven. A lot of people think they have tried uh, you know Atlantis but they haven't. It's ATL number seven. There was a mislabeling that happened years ago and it screwed up all the prints pretty much all the real Atlantis got lost because of the mislabeling with the ATL number seven but I was lucky enough to get my hands on an Atlantis print way before the mislabeling happened and I've kept it in my library ever since. Next we got some Liberty Caps. You guys know what these are especially if you're from Europe these are more common to you guys but over here in the states they're pretty rare so if you guys could get one in your library I suggest you do so. We got some Psilocybe Azurcense. Now most of you guys in the Pacific Northwest, you guys know what this is. This is one of the most highly regarded mushrooms and most people say this is the most potent mushroom hands down. You know it's debatable between this and Psilocybe sciensis but most people say that Azurcense is the most potent mushroom that you could get your hands on today. Next we have some Penelia sciensis Australian RDU. Now 
this is a very rare spore print. It was out there on the market for a little while, but now you can't get your hands on one. You can't find them anywhere, and if you do, I suggest you scoop it up. This is a Penelia Sciences Australia, but it drops a rust-colored print. I was actually lucky enough to get mines from Sporeworks when they first came out, and I've had it in my library ever since. Next, we have some Penelia Sciences Sanguil. Now, this is a pretty new print to hit the market. You guys could go out and get one right now, but up until recently, these weren't available. But now, a couple reputable vendors have them in stock, so if you guys are lucky enough, you guys could go and get your hands on one right now. I'm really excited to see how these turn out. Next, we have some Penelia Sciences Hosteca. Now, this is pretty new as well. It's from Mexico. It's a Penelia Sciences. It came out about the same time as the Sanguil. And I'm really excited to see how these turn out. These are new to my library as well. All right, guys. So that's the prints that I'm working with right now, both, you know, Cubensis and Exotic. So I'm just going to put them back in there. And let's take a look at some of the spore syringes that I'm working with right now. We'll just run through them real quick. So right here, we have some Salasabi Gallandoy or ATL number no. seven. Great sclerotia producing. Um, mushroom, it's also the one that was confused for Atlantis, but I got both and both are great. Right here we have some Penelia Sciences Jamaica, or what people call pan jams. These are great mushrooms. I've had them in my library for a long time. They're great mushrooms to look at under a scope and observe, so make sure you guys grab some. Right here we have some Penelia Sciences Hawaii. As you guys can see, nice big spore clump in there. These are great, they put out really nice big fruits and I love working with them, so make sure you guys try to get some of these as well. Right here, we have some Psilocybe Sciences. As you guys know, we were just talking about the Azurcents. This is the Sciences. They both grow in the same area on the same substrate and there's a debate on which one is more potent. You know, it's really up to you guys to decide, but both of them are great mushrooms to have in your library. Right here, we have some Penelius Cambos. And these are great to have in your library. These ones are from Thailand. So that's gonna be it for the syringes that I'm working with right now. Now let's take a look at the Cubensis syringes that I'm working with right now. And that's gonna wrap it up for what I'm currently working with right now in this spore library. Right here, we have some Psilocybe Cubensis Penis Envy. Now this is a big hit, you know, in the mycology community, you guys love this. And I wanna take this moment to show you guys something. So you guys could see how there's white around the spores. You know, the spore isn't just this dark clump. You also got this white fluffy stuff. That's absolutely normal for older syringes. So what will happen is the spores will actually start to germinate inside the syringe and you guys will see mycelium strands or mycelial strands within the syringe. It's not a bad thing, it's actually a good thing. It means growth has already started. It's very, very, very common for older syringes to see some of the spores already starting to germinate within the syringe. A lot of people write to me and they get worried about that, but it's not a problem. As long as you guys have it inside your refrigerator, like my spore library here, it will be perfectly fine and ready for use when you guys are ready to use it. Right here, we have some Psilocybe cubensis Cambodia. Right here, we have some Psilocybe cubensis Z strain. We have some Psilocybe cubensis Escondido. Right here, we have another favorite of the mycology community, AA plus albino. The color of them is absolutely beautiful. Now, it's not a true albino, but it's a cool mushroom to observe. Right here, we have some Koi, or what people call Kiss, because this is the super strain. Now, I love these. So here we have some Psilocybe cubensis, Rusty White. So this is also a mushroom that drops a rust-colored spore print. Really cool mushroom to observe. And I'm working with them right now, and hopefully you guys will be able to see uh, tech in the future with these right here. And right here we have some Purple Mystics. They're a really cool mushroom to observe. So make sure you guys get your hands on some. And that's gonna wrap it up for what I'm working with right now in my spore library. And there you go guys, that's the correct professional way to build the spore library. Now, you guys could have more than one spore library like I do. I have one for overstock and spores that I'm not currently working with. And then I have one of spores that I am working with at the moment. You know, you guys could have as many as you want. You guys could have one, two, three. It really doesn't matter. 
you guys could build a really extensive library. There's so many different species, subspecies, strains out there. You guys could collect forever. It's really up to you. At one point in time, mines were so extensive, I had almost 140 different strains, subspecies, and species in my spore library. But what I noticed is I wasn't getting around to them the way I should, you know, it was just too many to keep in rotation, to put on agar, to put to culture slants, that some of them stopped being viable because I wasn't working with them. So what I really started to do was wean back, start giving away some of the ones I wasn't using at the moment, and focus more on the exotic and rare prints in my library. And that's what I've been doing up to date, but I still have a lot of stuff to give away. So make sure you guys go follow me on social media, hit that subscribe button down below. Hopefully this video helped you out and it was informative. And if it did help you out, please let me know in the comments down below. And also one thing I would like to know from you guys in the comments down below is what is one type of spore print you would love to have in your spore library? Whether it's common or rare, I would really like to know, you know, I'd really like to know what you guys would like to have. That one, let's say, holy grail print or syringe that you want to have in your library. Thank you guys for all your love and support. I'm Willie Michael. Do good, be good, live good. Namaste.